Well, summer is in full swing here in Chicago, and the kids here are enjoying all that Lake Michigan has to offer, so it seemed like a good time to talk about near drowning. So let's start off with how it happens. Generally, it's lack of adult supervision, usually in a backyard pool, possibly the bathtub. Also, an overconfidence in swimming skills. This is especially what we see in Lake Michigan drownings or near drownings. You can also have problems with children who have developmental delay or seizure disorders. Also, arrhythmias that occur during swimming can cause near drownings. And also just secondary injury, for example, any head trauma while diving or falling off a powerboat, for example. So in talking about pre-hospital care, if the patient's unresponsive, one thing we do want to mention is that the ABCs are a little different. Usually we think of CAB with continuous quality CPR. We still want to do that, but first, in these cases, our main problem is a ventilatory problem, meaning we want to give two rescue breaths first. This is specific for near-drowning resuscitation. Since hypoxia is such a major injury, you want to make sure you have good ventilation and intubate early. Also, you need to think about rewarming the patient. Two things you want to not do in pre-hospital care. The high milk is not shown to help get the water out, so that's not helpful. Don't try it. Also, interestingly enough, uh, the AHA 2010 guidelines do not recommend C-collar as a routine therapy in near drowning, unless, of course, there's obvious head or neck injury or a traumatic mechanism. For example, a speedboat accident or a shallow dive. Of course, no one's going to fault you for putting a C-collar on. So what happens when you hit the water? There's usually a lot of panic, breath holding, air hunger, and this usually leads to one of two things, either aspiration, which is wet drowning, or a reflexive laryngospasm, which is dry drowning, and actually occurs in about 10 to 15% of patients. Both of these leads to hypoxemia and lung injury. So the injuries that we see in near drowning patients are the following by system. Pulmonary, there's surfactant washout, pulmonary edema, shunting, all of these leads to an ARDS-like picture. From a neurologic standpoint, hypoxia can lead to ischemia and increased intracranial pressure. From a cardiovascular standpoint, you can have hypothermia and hypoxia, which can lead to a variety of arrhythmias. And from an acid-based standpoint, that can lead to a respiratory or metabolic acidosis. Now, some of you may have heard of some of these theories that there's a difference between aspirating salt water and fresh water. So the old hypothesis was that aspirating salt water in the lungs draws fluid into the lungs, causing pulmonary edema and hypertonic serum. The theory for fresh water in the lungs is that it rapidly absorbs into the lungs, causing volume overload and dilution. While cadaver studies have shown that in reality, you need to aspirate almost 1.5 liters for these effects to be seen. In other words, you're dead already. So this is not our near-drowning patients. An average near-drowning patients aspirate about one-fourth of this. One other thing that's worth consideration in near-drowning patients is if they have a long QT. Swimming and breath holding or diving can all be triggers of VTAC and VFib in patients with long QT. And this may actually be much more common cause of drowning than we suspect. So make sure to get an EKG on any near drowning patient that you have to rule out long QT. So let's talk about management in the ER for near drowning patients. And we're going to divide this up by asymptomatic, mild symptoms, and severe symptoms. So all patients that come into the ER for near drowning, you just start off with IVO2 monitor. Keep that sat above 94%, and on the monitor, make sure and watch out for arrhythmias or desaturations. Warm them up, dry them off, and prevent hypothermia. For patients that are asymptomatic, you need to get a chest x-ray to look for delayed or developing pulmonary edema. So if when they hit the door, they're asymptomatic, have a normal lung exam, no crackles, no hypoxemia, you need to hold them, obs them for eight hours, and then get a chest x-ray before discharging them home. The reason behind that is that all patients that developed symptoms or problems after near drowning did so within eight hours. For patients with mild symptoms, of course, make sure you do a trauma eval or altered mental status workup as needed. Check your basic labs. In these patients, you should consider getting a chest x-ray immediately, especially if they have crackles or hypoxemia to look for immediate pulmonary edema, and also consider getting that delayed one a little while later. Get an EKG to rule out long QT syndrome. And as far as treatment, make sure and rehydrate them. You can consider giving them NEBS for bronchospasm or use CPAP if they're really having some struggles breathing. Their disposition is going to be a Talibat or OBS unit to look for further progression of that pulmonary edema. For patients with severe symptoms, you need to think about intubating early. Make sure you think about lung protective vent settings. These patients are going to develop an ARDS-like syndrome. 
Also make sure you get that OG tube in early because they probably swallowed a lot of water and you don't want to add to the aspiration that they already have. In a patient that you're resuscitating or doing CPR, make sure to get a core temperature. You need to do CPR until they're warm. And also think about neuroprotective treatment in these patients that might have hypoxemic brain injury. Elevate the head of bed, monitor the intracranial pressure, and think about a seizure prophylaxis. These patients are going to be going to the ICU. One thing to note for emergency department care, things that come up pretty often, is you should give these patients prophylactic antibiotics. They are not recommended unless the patient has been known to have aspiration of very dirty or contaminated water, but in general, you don't need to add prophylactic antibiotics. Steroids, similarly, are not indicated for these patients. It has not been shown to be helpful. There's another question as to whether you should keep these patients cold as a part of therapeutic hypothermia. In general, in order to resuscitate and do effective CPR, you need to at least warm them up initially. After that, there's not a lot of real good evidence one way or the other. If anyone has any suggestions, please let us know in the notes below. So three to remember for near drowning. If they're asymptomatic, you need to do an eight-hour observation with a delayed chest x-ray to check for pulmonary edema. Then you can actually send these patients home. Make sure you get an EKG to rule out long QT syndrome and make sure you warm these patients up. Thanks again for joining us on EMN5.